Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk today about a topic that kind of amounts to the, uh, the third rail of this discussion of uh, the future of news, and that's the role of government. And uh, so we're going to touch that rail a bit lightly, perhaps, and uh, see what happens this morning. I think if you would uh, go out on the streets of Boston today and ask a sampling of people whether government ought to stay out of the current uh, revolution in the news business, um, I bet you get an overwhelming uh, response of yes, uh, stay out. And I, I, I would guess that you get the same response if you ask uh, a sampling of people inside the convention hall here. And in a way, that sentiment uh, roughly lines up with the, uh, uh, what, what government is doing today. So far, <coughs> anyway, government is uh, largely staying out. No major initiatives have been enacted. There's some talk, but I wouldn't say that anything is, is really in the pipeline. And <clears throat> this may be exactly the right choice uh, for now and going forward. Um, as you all know, in the news business, it's the Wild West out there right now, and it's a period of tremendous <coughs> up upheaval. Uh, and um, what would we guess the odds would be that policymakers would make exactly the right choice that would uh, further the cause of news and information in the future as opposed to impede this uh, re revolution that we're going through right now. Um, and for all we know, uh, and, and actually hope, the internet will usher in a golden age of news information uh, with or without any of the current uh, big players, if only we let that revolution play out unfettered. There's a second reason to stay out, of course, and that's uh, two centuries worth of American skittishness over having government involved in the uh, news business. So together, that's a, that's a pretty solid one-two punch for the argument that government should stay on the sidelines as this news revolution <coughs> plays out. Except that uh, the government, and really we should say governments at every level of the United States, can't stay out, and why not? It's because they're already in. Uh, the truth is the federal government has been supporting the news business almost since the founding of, of the country. Uh, the most notable example being the um, subsidizing of postal rates for printers who mailed out the news of the day. Since then, government policies have uh, benefited new, uh, the news, businesses, news business uh, directly or indirectly by huge sums uh, currently in billions of dollars a year. In some cases, it's direct infusion of cash through uh, state and federal tax breaks. In other cases, it's indirect subsidies um, that have the same effect. Witness municipal rules that allow newspaper vending boxes on the public square, often at no charge or little, little cost. Witness also state, local, and federal statutes that require public notice <coughs> uh, publication in newspapers. These provisions alone are worth hundreds of millions of dollars to the news industry and have been important pieces of the economic well-being over the life of our country. So this puts kind of a different shading on the question of what the government does now going forward. If it has long taken a role in subsidizing the news business, which it has, what should it do now when everything seems up for grabs? At the University of Southern California, Annenberg School for Communication, uh, with a grant from Carnegie, former Dean Jeff Cowan and I, along with three PhD students, are taking a look at this question. And this is our vantage point. Whatever is the best policy course with respect to the information revolution, our nation's government governments have extremely important interests in what now transpires. Because as we know, no matter what you predict about the road ahead, one thing will not change, and that is our government just doesn't work, at least not very well, unless Americans have a robust supply of reliable news and information. This matter then really moves into the realm of a vital na national interest, and so at a minimum, it's not sufficient for our government or our governments to be mere spectators while this remarkable upheaval plays out. In the paper we'll publish this fall, we will argue that our government needs to understand 
and to closely monitor what's transpiring and to imagine policy options for the unpredictable future. The earliest signal we saw from the Obama administration uh, came from the Justice Department and that it was going to uh, beef up, not relax, antitrust in enforcement. Um, the Department of Justice did not see an obvious need to help newspaper publishers or others with an antitrust waiver, one that might allow them to craft a common web uh, pricing policy or combine newspapers, uh, newspaper and broadcast properties in single markets. In recent weeks, though, the administration has been sending somewhat different signals that it intends to engage on the information revolution. Uh, the new chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, John Leibovitz, told the, the RAP web website this week that the FTC would conduct robust hearings on what's happening in the news business and express openness to the idea of relaxing antitrust rules. He told the RAP uh, that the FTC would examine, quote, what the future will look like and, 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 uh, and whether that future, which might be a handful of newspapers and networks, that don't have nearly as much reach as they once did, plus five million bloggers, is a good thing for American democracy. In another development this week, the new head of the uh, <coughs> FTC's Consumer <coughs> Protection Division, David Blatting, told the New York Times that he plans to investigate practices in the online advertising world, particularly with respect to privacy protection for consumers. So it now appears government, at least in some ways, uh, at, at the uh, at the administration level is indeed starting to engage. In our work at USC Annenberg through the Center on Communication Leadership and Policy, we're looking at uh, six different intersections between the news business and federal and local governments. Um, and they are antitrust and copyright issues. Uh, you'll see this on the uh, one pager that was on the table. Antitrust and copyright issues, obviously a huge, huge sprawling area right now. It's uh, very, very hot. Broadband policies, postal rates and regulation, tax policies, uh, public broadcasting, including international broadcasting, and public notice publication requirements. We know these represent only a few of the pertinent areas. Uh, notice I didn't mention uh, the uh, three, three letters FCC. But we think they uh, reveal an interesting cross-section that might be helpful to policymakers and others as they think about government options going forward. We're also uh, here in Boston <coughs> eager for feedback and reaction, so I'll welcome your comments uh, after my short presentation. One of the things we've learned as we've progressed is that uh, in some ways the government is reducing and has been reducing its backing for the legacy news business even as large chunks of it struggle for survival. I think uh, most of us know what's happened <clears throat> over the last four decades on postal rates. Up until the early 1970s, the gov government subsidized about three-fourths of uh, the cost of mailing newspapers and magazines, uh, news magazines. Now that subsidy is largely gone, and the Postal Service is proposing changes, um, especially currently on newspaper total market coverage products, that would push up costs even more. And given the Postal Service's own economic problems, uh, the pressure here is likely continu uh, to continue. A more uh, current example of declining government support is the emerging campaign, and really at all levels of government, to end publication requirements uh, or, or drastically reduce them on public notices. The idea being that free dissemination on a government website, for example, might be just as effective as publication in the newspaper, especially when the savings uh, are in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, a year are, are possible. Uh, it's the figure that we're trying to uh, quantify or at least come close to understanding what the, what the dimension of this is, but we know it's very large. Uh, so far, publishers have succeeded in turning aside many of these proposal, proposals, but it seems only a matter of time that this subsidy will fade also. Tax subsidies for print publications are also likely to decline, and they probably already are, since many are tied to the uh, ink and paper manufacturing side that has in the past declined. So you have some indication here of government disinvestment at a time when 
the legacy news business is threatened with extinction. Again, this doesn't mean that uh, these policies are ill-advised, but it, they are interesting to note, we believe. I'm not going to go into detail uh, on all of our six policy areas. I'm not even going to go into antitrust and uh, copyright here, but I thought I'd mention just a few that have some intriguing uh, aspects. One is public broadcasting, including the federal government's international broadcasting programs. We've seen quite a bit lately about public broadcasting's aspirations to become a much bigger player uh, in the new news ecology. NPR's new uh, chief executive, Vivian Schiller, sees the potential for public radio to be become a dominant and, uh, reading between the lines, perhaps the dominant uh, player in local news. Here, quite obviously, um, is a way federal and possibly state and local governments could make a splash if they so decided by pouring, uh, by pouring dollars into public broadcasting, the public broadcasting infrastructure that could, could be a linchpin <coughs> of a national news and information network. Public broadcasting officials uh, say they're not looking for this kind of government investment, but the, but the um, policy option is clearly there. It's not written in stone that the United States will remain near the bottom of the developed world in per capita support of public broadcasting. As uh, Robert Chesney of uh, Free Press has suggested, it would take, uh, uh, in his view, better than a 20-fold increase in public media funding for the United States to achieve high-quality news programming. And even then, Great Britain would still be spending three times more per capita. Another piece we're looking at here is the role of international broadcasting programs such as uh, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, Alvira, and so on, which are uh, really instruments of the nation's uh, foreign policy apparatus. Federal law pr prevents such broadcasts from being aimed at a domestic audience, but technology is making that requirement meaningless. Today, for example, a large chunk of Voice of America's internet traffic comes from the United States and its broadcast can be watched on YouTube. So just as Americans are now privy to government-sponsored information from countries around the world, they are also becoming <coughs> privy to their own government-sponsored information. And that has very important uh, implications for U.S. public broadcasting uh, policy going forward. Another area is the role states and local governments have played and could play on tax policy. Uh, you may have seen the story uh, a few months ago about how the state of Washington approved a tax break of more than a million dollars for its state's publishers. In fact, the states have quite an elaborate and lucrative system of tax breaks already in place for publishers. And when you look at this collectively, you see they're all over the map in the kinds of tax subsidies they provide. Uh, in short, there's plenty of room, uh, if their political leaders so chose, uh, to widen tax breaks for publishers. And that goes for cities and counties as well. Right here in Boston, the mayor recently offered a $200,000 loan to help keep the city's only black-owned newspaper in business. Uh, and I should note, too, of course, we're, we're hearing a, a lot of debate at the na uh, national level about tax policy and the possibility of, uh, as Senator Cardin of Maryland has uh, suggested, of favorable tax legislation that would allow uh, more easily newspapers to convert uh, to nonprofit status. <coughs> the new broadband expansion project as part of the stimulus money is a good example of how, um, whether you like it or not, the government really does continue to remain involved in, in uh, subsidizing news and information. Dissemination of news may not be the first priority of broadband or the broadband expansion <coughs> program. But it nonetheless is an obvious and important byproduct, one that um, Alberto Bartolin of the Knight Foundation uh, says is the most important um, investment that the federal government can make. Uh, and, and let's face it, the United States is way, way behind uh, the rest of the world uh, in terms of broadband build, build out, and, uh, and the government obviously could do much, much more in this area. And this raises a final point, and that is, if government decides it should play a role at this moment in the history of news and information, it really has a lot of running room. It could decide to place a bet on legacy media during this time of transition. 
For example, it could consider antitrust or copyright changes that might give newspapers and other legacy um, <coughs> media a chance to regroup. It could back off on further cuts in postal rates and service. Or governments at all levels could put on hold initiatives to end public notice publication requirements. And of course, there are other options, other avenues that tilt in a different direction. If government is cutting back on subsidies for legacy media, what about redirecting that money into new media? For example, uh, still more federal dollars for broadband. Uh, and in, in a similar way, there's um, you know, the possibility of grant money for local news and information digital projects. Uh, demonstra uh, demonstration projects, perhaps in underserved areas, <coughs> or as the free press has suggested, perhaps a jobs program for out-of-work journalists. <laughs> as I said at the outset, government's wisest course may be to uh, reject intervention at this volatile moment in history. Uh, our, our project's two cents worth uh, is that governments at every level, uh, not to mention the American public, should be well informed about government's past and current <coughs> relationship with the news business. And they should have policy option, uh, options in mind as the future comes to us at, at an astonishing speed. We may well be headed for a new digital enabled enlightenment in which Americans can be informed like never before about the civic and political life of this country. But the future may be somewhat different and may include something of an interim gray age of news and information. The truth is, as Adam said uh, a few minutes ago, we don't know what it will look like. And so we think it is probably a very good time for the government to be well up on its toes. Thanks very much. where the director of the BBC News International was speaking about their web presence and their international uh, broadcasting presence. And I can't remember the exact number. It was either a two or a three. Somebody asked him, what is your circulation? How many people do you reach? And he said, we reach two billion people a day, which caused gasps in the audience. But while you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the loss of political boundaries. And I wonder if you might say a few words about BBC. Here's a government-created uh, news service. Is there any reason if the US government fails to build up a news service in NPR that BBC might just turn its direction toward the US? It seems to me, in many respects, it already has. I, I, I don't know to what extent that's uh, a, a top priority in its strategic plan, but um, it's, it's, you know, it's not the only British uh, uh, news organization that has had a growing uh, audience in the United States, and clearly, clearly that's the case. I, mean, I think in so many ways, and, and you know, one of the things we're dealing with in a, in a, in a, in a macro way here, of course, is, is the buildup of, of, um, of cultural cultural and uh, regulatory and st statutory uh, pieces with respect to news and information that's colliding with this <laughs> revolution in the news business. Uh, and, but the boundaries of all this are breaking down so quickly. I mean, the, the, the notion that Americans can fully get this government-sponsored information uh, coming from all corners of the world, including the BBC. Uh, by statute, we're not supposed to get our own government-sponsored sponsored information. By culture, we're not supposed to be producing much of it anyway. Um, you know, all of that is, is, is busting up open uh, faster than we will be able to assimilate it politically. Uh, but I do think that the busting up does uh, create an opening for public broadcasting that, that uh, is there. It, when, you, when you look at what the people of public broadcasting, NPR, and PBS, and so on are saying, they have aspirations. There's no doubt about it. Get much bigger. They are saying, whether they, whether they really believe this or not, they are saying they want no um, government uh, 
enough systems to do that. They don't need it and so on. But, uh, you know, I think that option, that option is there. And, and I, I, I would guess, I don't know, but I would guess that it's quite possible that the political environment that now says, no, no, we couldn't do that, uh, will show Yes. There are three major news organizations in the USA. Uh, the New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, and AP. They have global brand, global name, and global impact. Are they in the danger of disappearing? Uh, these three organizations, the New York Times, and Wall Street Journal, and Associated Press, in any way going to lose their influence uh, in the global market? Well, uh, do we know? I, uh, I'm asking in, in some ways, I, I mean, uh, all of them are uh, threatened financially. Uh, you know, we know how uh, we know quite a bit about how threatened the uh, New York Times is uh, financially. Um, we know something about the other two also. I think so. So, I mean, uh, you know, on the one hand, I think that especially the Times. Uh, maybe the Wall Street Journal, I think, have the opportunity to expand their brands and to be the, the survivors or among the survivors in, in a way that would actually expand their global influence. Uh, but in its, you know, almost the same breath, we said, well, maybe they won't last this year. And so it's a funny, it's a very funny situation. I think they, that's what they, that's what they hope is that they they will be among the survivors and and, and their bank, uh, brand will. We'll, we'll get them a larger audience. What about AP, Associated Press? AP, well, you know, it's 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 got its work cut out for it. I mean, I, 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 AP isn't, uh, I guess, a brand in the same way. At least I think about the the, the other two, um, and it's you know obviously been trying very quickly to uh, to to uh, diversify away from its legacy news clients into uh, the digital markets. But that transition has proven to be very very difficult. Before we go to the next question, I, I wanted to acknowledge the presence of a, a case study that you just mentioned. Uh, Melvin Miller is here. He's the uh, publisher for the Bay State Banner, and he's going to be speaking about the experience with his paper today at 1.30, and I was going to ask him to talk a, tell a little bit about what he's going to share at 1.30. Thank you. Uh, I won't tell you too much, so you have to come to the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do want to say that with the uh, recession in full gear and suffering that, uh, terribly financially. None of the banks were interested in, in being financially involved with the newspaper business. Everybody should understand that. You know, we, as, as far as they're concerned, it's a, it's a dead industry. And uh, we have a program, however, in Boston uh, that is designed to help small businesses that are considered to be of special significance to the city. and. Uh, what made this unique is that even though I had been uh, criticizing the mayor in an election year, he fully understood the importance of the survival of the banner for the welfare of the city in the long run. Quite frankly, if he won the election and there were no banner, he'd be in deep trouble. So, so uh, he, he wisely understood that he needed uh, the paper in order for, to move the city forward. Uh, of course, he's very confident about winning the election anyway, I guess. And so he gave his approval for the loan. And, and as a matter of fact, I just closed it yesterday or the day before. So we're going to be around and have enough funds to ride out the uh, worst part of this recession. The indicators are that we're, we bottomed out and beginning to move up. And I think we've survived for 44 years. And I think we can go on a little bit further. Yeah. Well, Thank congratulations. You. And I, you know, I was thinking about, uh, about this at kind of the national level, too. Uh, when you, when you think about the, uh, the role of government here, you think, you know, public policy, you think uh, uh, sort of high-minded, uh, idealistic thoughts about what ought to be the role. But we're talking politics here, too. And uh, although this sounds kind of outlandish, it, it really isn't that outlandish that someday you might have uh, the, the political question being raised, who lost the news media? Whose fault was that? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's uh, you know, um, and this process you know is a political process ultimately, and uh, so so politics enters. And uh, one thing I would like to add. Um, 
I was a little disappointed at some of the coverage from the press because they seem not to understand economic issues. Uh, how the hell can you be a, a journalist in this modern day and it be totally, totally dead on economic issues? Because all of the things that you cited about the involvement of the government in, in uh, the media is absolutely true. And I, I wrote an editorial on my comeback criticizing the coverage. The way they covered it is as though the, the, uh, the mayor gave me money out of his campaign funds. And that wasn't the case at all. 